Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to part 6, I think, of starting astrophotography for lazy people. And today we're going to talk about mounts, like this big white thing here or this grey-black thing here. And we'll be, we'll be talking more about this white thing really because it is more appropriate for astrophotography and I'll get to the, to the why of that in a moment. So first things first, we have our overriding uh, principle which is to be lazy. Uh, which is why I will be recommending uh, mounts that can that are motorized on both axes. So you might see that every mount that you'll see will be will have the ability, in addition to doing the uh, initial setup, it will have the ability to rotate in two axes. So for example, this particular mount here, I can rotate it around one axis here, and I can rotate rotate it around another axis here. And similarly, the mount that's behind me, I can go in and I can rotate it around one axis uh, horizontal here, and I can rotate it uh, vertically as well. So that's, you know, with those two axes, I can reach pretty much any target in the sky and I can track my target. Because one thing to remember is that the ultimate pur purpose of mounts is to track your targets because um, well the targets move around the sky um, my north celestial pole is in this direction and uh, the stars will be rotating around that north celestial pole and we need to track that and it sounds simple and it's remarkably difficult uh, the stars uh, track the move at around one quarter of a degree per minute and uh, we remember that the from the FOV and resolution video, the pixels on my camera, well, they're they're like they maybe have a resolution of one of one or two arc seconds per pixel, and one arc second is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, and yet every single minute those stars are what I'm trying to track. They're moving at one quarter of a degree per minute. And we need to track that with such precision that those pixels that see one three thousand six hundredth uh, of a degree need to like have the stars not streaking through because the, the tracking has been done perfectly. That's completely crazy when you think about it. And yet this is what we accomplish routinely in this hobby, which is kind of, you know, amazing. Like let's uh, let's pat ourselves on the shoulder a little bit because we are accomplishing something that is truly awesome. So anyway, going back to those mounts, uh, there are two main type, types of uh, mounts that I've already mentioned in some of the previous uh, episodes. There's one type here that's called a German Equatorial Mount or Equatorial Mount or GEM, sometimes SEM for Chinese Equatorial Mount or Center Balanced Equatorial Mount, at least for if we believe the iOptron, uh, which is a, a mount ma maker uh, marketing. So that's one type. And then other type is Alt Azimuth for Altitude Azimuth also known as Alt-As uh, mounts. And this gem type is good for astrophotography. This Alt-As type is good for visual uh, astronomy and not so good for astrophotography. And let's go into the details why. One of the first obvious things is that my gem mount, my equatorial mount, it has one of the axes of rotation is parallel to the Earth's axis. So you can see like right now the, the the whole assembly, the whole telescope assembly with the camera is rotating around uh, an axis and that particular axis for me is pointing very precisely to the north celestial pole, which means that really it is parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. So that means that I can use this uh, motor here, a single motor that controls this whole axis to uh, basically track the stars, to, to go in the inverse direction of the Earth's rotation at precisely the same rate. So this 0 0.25 degrees per minute and I can use a single axis, single motor to actually counteract that rotation from the Earth. Um, so this is what makes uh, GEM, really it's the main factor that's ma that makes equatorial mounts so adept at astrophotography because you use a single axis to keep track of everything. And this is something to remember is that each axis will have mechanical errors, mechanical issues. The mechanism that we typically have, there's multiple mechanisms available, but the most common one is called worm gear uh, mechanism where you have um, 
a, a worm with indent, indentations, like kind of like snake-like indenta indentations within a, a pretty long cylinder that will rotate. And in those indent, indent, indentations, we have a gear with uh, actual teeth that are set in that. And by rotating that worm, we make the gears rotate as well. And the gears, the gear is, is directly basically linked to the axis of rotation like that. And the worm that ended indentation within that worm will actually spur the gears on. And if there's a single like impurity or imperfection in that worm, like uh, a couple of microns, then the rate at which the mount will rotate will deviate from the very precise rate that we need to uh, oppose the Earth's rot rotation and follow the stars. So there, there can be like imprecisions and that's very easy to get imprecisions. It's very hard to make very good mechan mechanics that can track perfectly without help. And actually it's almost impossible. So there's almost always some help outside of the mechanics, be it auto guiding. I mentioned that this little scope and camera at the top of my gem here can be used to track a star and then tell the mount whether it's going off track or there's something another method called uh, encoders and this one will typically be more expensive because uh, encoders will also tell the mount uh, but they don't need to uh, track the star and they need to be extremely precise and they're quite expensive and most mounts at least most of the mid-range to low range mounts do not have such uh, encoders okay so we see that the german german equatorial mount is superior because it can track through a single axis at the same time you can see that because of its weird configuration i need to counteract the weight of my uh, whole telescope assembly there with the camera using counterweights uh, otherwise you know we'd have a, a, a motor that has to struggle uh, to carry this weight all on one side of the axis that would be terrible uh, there are some mounts that use different types of uh, gears called strain wave gears or harmonic gears that actually can do without counterweights uh, but they're very expensive and they in my experience at least with the mount that i received but it's, it might have been defective um, it's not super precise so it's a bit different to use than a normal german equatorial mount now uh, the alt as mount it will be able to track the stars as well by the way it's uh, but then because the stars move in a circle that is not um, uh, related to either of the axis of rotation of this mount whether it is azimuth which is like horizontal or deck uh, or altitude which is like this uh, vertical um, movement here uh, the it needs to use both motors to actually keep track of the targets in the sky so it will need to move horizontally and will need to move vertically every moment to keep track of the stars so instead of the imperfections of one single mechani mechanism that keeps track of everything through one axis we now need to do everything through two axes so we have two sources of errors and it becomes complicated but that's not all one of the things you'll notice with uh, my mounts here is that when I have the uh, telescope pointed here, you can see that my camera is pointed to you, to your, in your direction. And so the, the actual mirror of the telescope, it's also oriented so that the bottom of that mirror is actually pointed uh, horizontally towards you. If it's like this, now we have the camera point, pointing down and the butter, bottom of the mirror is also pointing down. Uh, when we're doing this, we'll now have the camera pointed away from you horizontally and same for the uh, mirror so this means that we are actually rotating not only the whole telescope assembly but the telescope angle itself is rotating upon itself um, because of that and so that means that we are rotating the field of view and this is something else that's quite important to uh, to understand is the the phenomenon called field rotation field rotation is like okay my north uh, celestial pole is there and we are rotating around that so if i have an object that's vertical when it's to the east of my of my uh, 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 celestial pole then it rotates it rotates it rotates once it's above it's actually going to be horizontal from my perspective and then it keeps going and then it's going to be vertical again but opposite what it was when it was in the east so the objects itself not only do they move across the sky but from our point of view they also rotate 
So uh, that, that leads to a phenomenon called uh, field rotation, which is common, which is actually not common, which, is, which happens with alt azimuth mounts, uh, in that they are tracking the mount, the, the object perfectly. We could have like perfect motors, everything tracking perfectly, uh, but we still have something called field rotation because you can see that the angle of my telescope never changes. So it does not counter the rotation, the, the apparent rotation of the objects from my point of view. Uh, so it, we'll need, if we do alt as mounts, we'll need actually a third uh, axis of rotation, which will be at the camera level. It's called a derotator, and it will be countering the uh, field rotation from the object. Otherwise, you'll see that if you take a long exposure like that with a camera without any derotator, the stars at the edge of the frame still start to streak because they're rotating around the axis that you are imaging. It's it's so fun to watch actually, but it's not very good. You can still do astrophotography with an alt S mount. This is how I started. And I've also done some more in Death Valley, right, where it's so dark that you know a child could take a picture that's amazing in like 20 minutes. But uh, it is not ideal because of all of those reasons. It is possible for many alt S mounts to actually be mounted on something that's called a wedge uh, that will actually basically orient the mount so it can be pointed towards so one of the axes can now be parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. So in the end your Altes mount really becomes a German equatorial mount. Not quite but that's kind of uh, of the principle. So that's uh, possible and you'll see that fork based telescopes in particular like the Mead LX200, Mead LX600, uh, the Celestron CPC, I think even their evolution lines they can support wedges. It's uh, Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, not as good. Uh, generally, you would prefer a, a standard uh, German equatorial mount. Uh, by the way, the axis of that Ger German equatorial mount, uh, this one is called the RA axis for right ascension. So that's the axis that is parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. And the other uh, axis that is perpendicular is the DEC axis or declination axis, this one. Okay, and now we understand the differences between those mounts. We understand that this mount is more adept at astrophotography because it, it needs to rotate on a single axis to keep track of the stars as they uh, go around the, uh, the celestial pole. And at the same time, it will keep track of the angle of the object as it moves, the apparent angle of the object as it moves around the sky because the whole Optic optical assembly along with the camera is actually rotating at the same time that the object is apparently rotating upon itself. So it counters a lot of things very easily whereas if you want to do imaging with an alt as camera, uh, alt as mounts, there's a lot of workarounds you need to do. So I'm not really going to talk anymore about alt as mounts except to say that there is one particular alt as mount that I could recommend for beginners. It's the AZ GTI, which is a small, tiny little mount that can actually put batteries in, and you can use it together with a wedge uh, for uh, the Star Adventure wedge. They're both from uh, the brand called Skywatcher, and uh, it will support like small equipment, like a, a, a camera with a small camera lens. Uh, so like 50 millimeters, 100 millimeters, maybe 200 millimeters. Uh, some people have been successful with more, but there's a problem with quality control and variability, which I'll get to uh, a bit later. Um, but still, it can be a very good alt as mount because you can mount it on a wedge. It's very cheap. It doesn't support a lot of equipment on top. It will not support a lot of payload or weight on top, but it can be great to start if you're gonna start with a very small like lens and uh, camera. Uh, so don't reject alt as mounts directly if they have a wedge and people have proven that you can good, get good results out of them. Uh, otherwise, yeah, avoid them. So that's one of the things with mounts you'll see is that you'll want to check uh, the forums. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about how we want to select our mount. And selecting mounts, it's not as simple as looking at the specifications of the mount. Uh, because there are so many things that can go wrong with a mount. And let me first say that the mount is the heart of your system. The mount is the biggest source of frustration in your system, typically. The mount makes or breaks your system. It is always better to have an expensive mount with a cheap optical tube assembly than the opposite. 
the mount makes or breaks everything. The optical tube assembly, it needs to be precise, but you know, it's pretty static with the, aside from the focuser, which you're, you're not moving all the time. The mount needs to move at a precise speed all the time while it can be carrying huge payloads. So this is like more than 10 kilograms on this, uh, this poor mount right now. So you can tell that the mount will be the one doing the most work uh, overnight and it's critical work if the mount um, messes up uh, you're going to not have a good image so uh, it is really the heart of the system it can be the biggest source of frustration so we want to choose a mount that will minimize that frustration because we want to be lazy so let's first get to get to our lazy principle uh, some mounts, uh, which I mentioned in previous episodes in this series, like star trackers, are uh, simplified German, German equatorial mounts, really. Um, or, no, they're, they're standard G German equatorial mounts, but they can rotate around the RA axis, so the axis that's parallel to the Earth, and they have a motor to let them rotate at the, uh, at the speed that is required um, for, for that. On top of that, there are uh they have the declination axis is manual so you need to move that manually and i don't want to recommend that uh, because the um the problem with that is that you cannot do automated uh, plate solving and centering of your objects it's basically a technique by which you'll be first asking the mount like hey could you point to this target and the mount will point to the target to the best of its ability and usually it's off and can be off by lots. So then what you can do is you take uh, an exposure of the stars that the mount is pointed to. You ask the computer like, hey, I have those, the star field there. Where is my mount actually pointed at? And the computer will answer like, oh, you're actually pointed here. The mount will be told like, yeah, you're not pointed where you think you are pointed. You're pointed there. And the mount will, be, uh, will say, oh, okay, let me re- uh, point to the correct place and that's called plate solving that's the the act of taking that image that star field and identifying where in the sky you were pointing and doing the recentering it's the point at which the mount will re-slew to the proper target and you can have several iterations of that until the mount is perfectly on target um, and you cannot do that with a star tracker so things like the star adventurer the ioptron sky guider or sky guider pro i keep our star our tracker pro i don't know i don't remember all the names there are the vixen polarie they're all very good they, they can you can get absolutely you know you can get just as good images as with this huge mount here so they're small they're nice they're cheap but they are not uh, motorized on both axes and to me that's th that disqualifies them as being mounts for lazy people so that's why I would not recommend star trackers if you want to be lazy. If you want to be lazy, you want to have mounts that are motorized on both uh, axes. And if your equipment is go not going to be very heavy, there are actually some very cheap mounts uh, that are motorized on both uh, axes. There's the uh, Ioptron Smart EQ Pro Plus. I used to own its predecessor. It's the, the, the mount I took uh, my very first nice astrophotographs uh, with. Um, it did break on me after a while, but okay, details. And uh, there's another one that's more recent. I think it's a brand I haven't, I have never seen or tested called Bresser, Bresser I100 or something like that mount that is also very cheap and is motorized on both axes. And to be able to do this plate solving and centering, by the way, you need the mount uh, to be able to communicate with a computer. And so you need the mount to make sure that the mount has an ASCOM driver. So ASCOM is a uh, standard for astronomy in terms of how to control stuff. And if the mount has an ASCOM driver, then it means it can be controlled from the computer. And that means you can uh, actually use it to plate solve and center automatically. Okay, so uh, now we know that for being lazy, we want to be able to control the mount from a computer along both axes so we can do plate solving and recentering of those mounts. Um, another thing is when you look at the spec sheets of the mounts, you need to think about how much of a payload. Yeah, so like what, with, what will be the weight of your telescope camera and everything else on your mount. Um, and then you need to check with the rated payload capacity of that mount. So I mentioned that all of this here is probably around 10 kilograms. So 
if you're looking at your telescope and camera, you'll also have to add maybe a filter wheel. You'll definitely have to add a guider and a guiding camera. And those will add weight. So take the weight of your telescope, the weight of your camera, add two or three kilos to that, and that will be your payload. And then you want to compare that to the rated payload of the mount, which is in the specifications. But uh, there's a problem with that in that uh, each manufacturer, they have different criteria for their payload capacity. So some manufacturers, they will actually quote a payload capacity that is good for astrophotography or imaging. And in my experience, brands like Takahashi or um, Vixen or uh, I, I have heard, I have not tested myself, uh, but Paramount um, or uh, I don't remember the name, the, the Mac 1 and Mac 2 uh, mount makers, they quote uh, payloads that are for astrophotography. Whereas some other manufacturers, uh, like Skywatcher, the maker of that, uh, that mount, or iOptron, they'll typically quote a capacity that's more like about visual astronomy, uh, sometimes in, in the middle. And so they'll, they'll kind of be overestimating how well their mount can carry a payload for astrophotography. And the general rule of thumb is that you want to take the rated payload capacity of the mount divided by two. And this is what you'll be comparing to the actual weight of your equipment. So uh, the weight of your equipment should be less than half of the rated payload capacity of the mouse. Uh, but this is something where you wa you'll want to actually look on forums, like ast astrophotography forums or like cloudy nights or astronomyforum.com. There's tons of forums around to see like what are the reviews of that mount, how much uh, weight payload have people put on the mount successfully and it's not enough that they say they've done it su successfully you probably want to check that they did do it successfully by seeing if they have published pictures uh, using that particular mount um, you want to see how well the mount is tracking how well the mount is guiding and by the way this is something that um, is common with mounts some of the mounts when you buy them they will quote uh, a PE error or periodic error. PE stands for periodic error. And it's basically due to that worm that I was mentioning earlier. That worm will rotate and needs many rotations to fully rotate the gear that it's attached to. And so with each rotation of the worm, if the worm has imperfections, which it does, will go through those imperfections over and over again. And so that's why it's a periodic error. And that's where the main source of errors is. It's from the worm. And so each time the worm rotates, it will go through the same imperfections over and over again. And uh, the periodic error is typically expressed in arc seconds. Uh, meaning like by how many arc seconds will the mount deviate from its proposed ideal tracking rate. Uh, and by the way, that tracking rate of 0 0.25 uh, degrees per minute, it's not exactly that because uh, there is atmospheric refraction uh, as well. So there's all sorts of stuff to consider, which is why having an auto guider is usually a good idea. Uh, but anyway, like mounts like the SEM 25P, I believe from Ioptron, they're rated for plus 10, minus 10 arc seconds, which is actually shockingly good for a mount at that price. Um, and, you know, some mounts do not have any number there. Uh, some mounts like the, uh, the Vixen uh, AXG is rated for plus minus four arc seconds. The AXD from Vixen is rated for plus minus uh, 2.5 arc seconds, if I remember correctly, which is... Um, uh, to the limit of what you can really uh, do. And some mounts, like from the premium mount manufacturers, like 10 micron, they use encoders, are like SEM, the SEM 60 EC or the SEM uh, 120 EC from uh, IOPTRON. They use encoder that claim that it will reduce their periodic error, or basically control their periodic error to within 0 0.5 plus minus 0 0.5 arc seconds. So there are things to check, but that's not everything because you have some mounts that have a lot of periodic error, uh, like plus minus 30 arc seconds. And yet, because they're so smooth in how you can auto guide them using a guider here, uh, they, they're very easy to deal with. And that's the case with, I think the, I've never used it, uh, but I think the Avalon uh, M1 or M0 mount, I don't remember, uh, has this kind of, uh, of not problem, but just behavior that is easily dealt with.
So you'll want to check on mount review sites how well the mounts will actually track and how well the mounts will guide because you could have a mount with a fairly low periodic error but yet the periodic error is so sharp the shape of the worm is so bad that it's, it's a peak that you cannot avoid and you cannot guide out because it is so sudden, right? So you'll want to check reviews. And that brings us to something else, which is mount variability. And mount variability is basically the lottery of buying a mount. When you're buying a mount uh, for astrophotography, uh, every mount is different, even from this, for the same model. So some mounts by, might be excellent samples and some mounts will be less good samples. Some mounts might even be seen as lemons. So, which is why you want to make sure that you buy from an, a reputable shop to which you'll be able to return the mount if you have issues. Um, Skywatcher, recently I've heard very good things about their quality control, but historically they've had issues with quality control. Iobtron uh, historically has had issues with quality control. Um, uh, Vixen or Takahashi, typically they're fine. You can, buy, uh, you can buy them and you have a low probability of getting a lemon. Same for the premium mount manufacturers in the US. Uh, but even then there is the chance of getting a bad mount, a lemon. So this is always something to keep in mind that there is a lottery uh, that's going on there. And so you'll want to, to, have, to make sure you buy from a decent shop that will accept returns for your mount or that you buy a mount where you have a high uh, confidence that you will not get a bad sample. So payload capacity, periodic error and variability. They're the main things you want to look at and you really want to look at forums. And there's tons of good mounts around. There's mounts from Celestron, from Skywatcher, from Ioptron, from Vixen, from Takashi, from other brands. And I've personally used Vixen mounts, Skywatcher mounts, Mead mounts, uh, Celestron mounts. Uh, Ioptron mounts. Uh, I have had, you know, very good success with some Ioptron mounts, not others. I have had very good success in general with Vixen mounts. I have had very good success with some Skywatcher mounts and not others. It, it all uh, kind of uh, kind of depends. So you know, check the forms. And uh, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about concerning the mount. So you really want an equatorial mount that is motorized in both axes, can be controlled via an ASCOM driver, so you can actually do plate solving and recentering. You, you need to make sure that the mount will be able to support your payload that you put on it. And for that, you want to not look only at the payload capacity that is rated by the manufacturer, you want to check on forums. And you want to check that people have had good results with that mount. Another way of looking at that is you go on astrobin.com, which is an image, uh, astro image hosting website, and you search for that particular mount to see what pictures have been taken uh, using that mount. And uh, if you have decided that you want to get a small optical tube assembly with a small camera, it's very light, you can go with a very light mount like the Smart EQ Pro Plus. Uh, if it's bigger, you can go to the SEM 25P if I go to Ioptron. If it's even bigger, the SEM 40. If it's even bigger, the SEM 60. If it's even better, bigger, the SEM 70, which is released soon. Or even bigger, SEM 120, and that's for a single brand. And each brand, they have all of those scales there. So you might want advice on uh, forums about like, okay, this is what I have, what mount should I buy? It may start a flame war, but stay polite, stay patient. There's tons of good advice to be had. There's something else we need to consider when we're taking, getting a mount is uh, how will we connect the uh, optical tube assembly, my imaging train really, to uh, the mount itself. And so we have something that's called a dovetail and most mounts will support a Vixen type uh, dovetail or V dovetail uh, are, and some mounts will also support a bigger one uh, called Lozmendi uh, dovetail or D type of uh, dovetail. And uh, this one you can see it actually has uh, play space for two uh, different dovetails. Dovetail. So right now I have a Vixen type dovetail in there. Uh, we could have a Lozmendi type dovetail here at the top. So it's a wider dovetail which is typically made for uh, bigger telescopes. But uh, there is one thing as well is that probably for your starting OTA, uh, for your starting like imaging train, telescope and camera, you're likely going for a refractor. I hope you're not going for a refractor that's too big, in which case you'll probably have a Vixen type of dovetail and most mounts are compatible with uh, that. And, uh, but that is still something to uh, check and to maybe ask the shop about like how will the mount be connected to my telescope and um, 
you know, how's the, what is the mechanism? Because, you know, the, 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 the shoe, what, what is really like gripping your telescope, sometimes it's just a screw that will actually mar your dovetail plate that's on the telescope side, which, you know, it works, but it's not super pleasant. And uh, this one doesn't. So it's just something to, to look at. And some of the premium mounts, the more expensive mounts, they actually don't come with any dovetail connection uh, to your uh, telescope. Uh, they come with screw holes basically that you're going to screw a dovetail connection of your own choosing which you can buy from uh, ADM accessories or other manufacturers of such uh, dovetail uh, shoes or whatever we call them to, uh, to actually put on there. But again if you're looking at mid-range to low range mounts they typically come with their dovetail connection uh, on. Another thing that is to consider with the mounts as well is whether there is a tripod on that. Most medium to, um, to low end mounts, they come with a tripod, so you don't even need to think too much about it. Uh, however, some tripods uh, are more mediocre than others, and tripods can be a very big factor in mount stability, and they can actually affect your imaging more than you can think. You, can, you would think. Uh, so they can be a big source of frustration. Uh, my tripod here is the standard tripod that comes with the Skywatcher, but you might notice if I look down here, I have a tripod uh, spreader. I don't remember the name from yet. Uh, TP, TP Astronomy, I think is the name there. There's this tripod spreader that can go really low on the legs. I put a counterweight on top, I shouldn't, but it makes things more stable to actually make that, tri that tripod even more uh, stable. So that is one thing to keep into account. Is the tripod of my mount decent? Uh, will I need to buy another one? Or even does my mount come with a tripod? If it's a high-end mount, very often they don't come with a tripod. You choose your own tripod. And then uh, it doesn't have to be a tripod. It can be um, a, a pier, which is basically a colon rather than uh, three feet. Uh, it's also something to keep in mind as well is when you're, if you have a long refractor, uh, so you went for a long refractor, at some angles it can hit the tripod legs if you have a tripod. So in this case you might want to check with the shop whether that would be the, shape, the, say, the, the case and then consider what is called a, a tripod extension or a half pier. Uh, which will basically make your mount higher on uh, on top of the tripod, just like a center column for a photo tripod, and therefore avoid hitting the legs of the tripod so easily. For my equipment, I have been able to work without this kind of uh, half pier or pier extension. Okay, so the tripod is an, n another important piece of the puzzle that should not be neglected. I know that some of the Ioptron mounts uh, came with bad tripods. Uh, and people were actually changing them and tun tuning them post-purchase. So that is something, again, you do not know from looking at the manufacturer website. You want to look at forums and at feedback on all of those uh, mounts. Um, uh, in the same place, you know, Ioptron has some of the best. Uh, they have the tripeer, which is uh, uh, half a, a hybrid between a pier and a tripod that has a very good reputation as far as I've seen. Uh, I've never had it, so I don't know, but uh, you know, it, you can have different types of equipment depending uh, even within the same uh, manufacturer. You may want uh, to also check like how easy it is to do the polar alignment. You see, I might, you might see that I have screws here that basically let me adjust my polar alignment so how parallel to the Earth's axis my uh, right ascension uh, axis is. And uh, the smoother this mechanism, the, the easier it is to, uh, to polar align. So something you might want to, to check uh, the reviews for. Uh, another thing as well is that typically each mount comes with a, a certain amount of counterweights so this particular uh, EQ6R mount came with those two white counterweights I've sandwiched another one in the middle because it was not enough to actually uh, um, have payload uh, have the payload that I have on top right now which is two uh, telescopes and um, the EQ like the Vixen mounts they have less trouble with counterweights because they have a system whereby their their mechanics are actually down here so they the mechanics themselves act as counterweights uh, this one you really need to put the counterweights very well down on the shaft which is typically something you don't really want to do so you'll want to check whether you'll need to buy additional counterweights for your setup um, and that's something you might want to check with the shop as well. You don't want to uh, have the mount arrive and to have Mirac 
miraculously clear skies and then you realize that you don't have enough counterweights to balance your equipment uh, and and balancing would mean that when i'm at the horizontal like that you know it doesn't uh, move around the, the telescope is not heavier than a counterweights uh, there's some tweaks that can be done uh, but that's pretty much the the spirit of it so that's something to keep in mind as well so uh, things like the attachment to the telescope so the dovetail connection the um, polar alignment uh, the uh, counterweight the quality of the tripod how to tune it uh, this kind of stuff is important you may also want to uh, look uh, in the forums about mount backlash and, and backlash is something that happens in, in pretty much, well, not all, but many mechanical systems uh, where if I, if I try to do this, there would be a little bit of play. I've already adjusted my mount to have as little uh, backlash as possible. Um, it is uh, especially important in the declination uh, axis for doing things like dithering, uh, but it is something you like to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, how is the backlash typically on that mount? But again, it could... Uh, depend uh, with the mount variability. So that's another few considerations to take in mind, to have in mind uh, when uh, choosing a mount. And that's pretty much it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope it was useful. If you like this video, please click like. Please also don't forget to subscribe and click on the little notification bell icon so you don't miss the next videos in this series. And uh, thank you so much. Don't forget to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.